everyone, Madeline Dell here, the Chapter Goddess. I am a mom, author, blogger, freelancer, podcaster, producer, and overall creative. With this show, I really want to focus on creatives and bring their authentic self to life. How are they motivated to pursue their passion? What have been the struggles along the way? Does self-care play an important role in who they are today and how they connect with the creative flow? Bringing one's authentic self to the forefront is important in this world that we live in currently. Sharing your self-care, your tips, and how you stay on track for things without losing it completely is also important. Self-care is not talked about enough, and authenticity and self-care are what I like to highlight with my creatives, as well as getting to know them. So, get ready for a fun and entertaining show. Hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and let's get ready to meet this episode. Yes. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Chapter Goddess Chat. We've got a fantastic creative for you guys to meet and learn a little bit about today. And then don't forget to hit that bu- the like button and subscribe. Check out their work and yeah, grab a good book. Um, but without further ado, let me bring him in and I'll let him introduce himself and the book we'll be talking about today. Oh, hi, there I am. Uh, hi, Madeline. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Steven. I write under the name S.A. Schneider. I write uh, middle grade fantasy. Uh, my first book is Embracing the Magic in the Town Magician series, and the second book is about halfway done. Yeah, sweet. So let's dive straight in to talk about this book. Where did you get the inspiration for it? I like inspiration better than idea. Everybody always hears idea, and that's like kind of a cliche question. Yeah. Inspiration is actually much more accurate here. Mm-hmm. So I'd been wanting to write for years, and when I finally got around to it, there were a couple things that pushed me into it. And I was working on a few things back and forth, but nothing that really was getting me to get out there. I was dragging my feet. Uh, life, work, family, everything came in the yeah. way. Well, I live by Kent State. Uh, in Mm -hmm. Ohio, and they do a wizarding festival every year. So I was like, that's, that's how I'm going to like go over that edge to get into it. I'll write a story so I can set up an author table at the wizarding festival. And I have something that fits in. So I came up with this really quick short story. It was, I don't know, 12,000 words or so. Mm -hmm. And my son read it and it was okay. And then I'm like, but you know what? it seems like it needs this and then this, and it could have this. And Mm -hmm. suddenly it became a whole novel and a whole book. And then it didn't stop. And I started writing down, well, book two could be this and book three could be this and book four. So I didn't even go to the Wizarding Festival that year. And I wrote the book and I'm working on book two. And I have at least two more ready or two more planned after that with possibly a fifth through seventh, uh, depending on how well it's received and how I feel at the time, because uh, I do have other series ideas going. Nice. That is amazing how that kind of like snowballed and became a series. I love books that do that, especially just the characters in the world that want to just keep going, you know? Yes, and it did. And the world I created kind of kept spinning out and more. And I kept answering questions about the world, which led to more uh, going on. And there were so many things with my character that I'm like, I could do this and this and this, that book two, three, and four all were ready and planned while I was working on book one. So there are things in book one that hint at what's coming in books two through four, but you don't really know it until hopefully books two to four come out. Nice. The little Easter eggs that are in there. Was that planned or did it just happen that way? Well, yes to both. I did plan it because I wanted that. I always wanted to write stories where there were some hints in in the first one that led to the second so that when I wrote them, it didn't feel like I was retroactively creating things or things didn't make sense. And I got that from George Lucas from Star Wars because there's a lot in the original trilogy that hint about things. And that's where the whole universe has come for the last 35 years. 
Yes, and that is a great universe. And honestly, I did not realize it was kind of like a Western theme to it till a couple weeks ago. Somebody pointed it out. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Mind yeah. blown the entire thing. This is like, I feel like I've just been oblivious to that for years. Right. Which I think is part of the reason Firefly was so popular and why I was so glad when they started Mandalorian. The first bit, those first couple episodes were yeah. very much back to that Western feel. I know it's so crazy though, like crazy. Sorry, I totally took us off on a different topic. So, so okay, I'm giving away my idea. I'm sure somebody's gonna hear this and they're gonna run with it, and I'm gonna be like, oh, I shouldn't have done. But you know the old spaghetti westerns with Clint Eastwood in them, hanging yeah, high. Yeah. Wouldn't that be great to redo those with Boba Fett? Yes. Like redo cool. the movies with Boba oh. Fett. I think that would be amazing. Yes, because those are basically like classics. Those are totally yeah. like if you've watched Western any, you have to have watched anything with Clint Eastwood in it. Like it's just like right. it's like a John Wayne thing. You can't not. Yes. Those are the big, big ones in there. Exactly. Nice. So I'm going to take us back to your work now. Let's talk about Samuel. Did I say his name right? Your yes. Character? Yep. Tell me more about him. Like what? What is his life like? How does he find himself in? the position where magic is being challenged. Samuel is what I hope all the 10 to 12 year olds can relate to somebody that's trying to fit into his world that wants more out of his life and isn't quite sure how to get it or do it, but he doesn't recognize the strengths he has himself. And that's kind of the basis of the whole book in a fantasy setting. And the other I, I was in a mastermind with an author friend of mine, Jay Thorne. And through that, I started to realize a lot of my stories, a lot of the way I think, a lot of the books I've been writing have to do with essentially there's magic all around us. We just have to recognize it. And that's yeah. kind of become the overall theme mm -hmm. of everything I've been writing unintentionally. And that's Samuel. So you take that, you know, a normal 11 year old kid not knowing where he fits in the world and trying to figure the world in himself out. You put him in a magical setting with that theme of magic all around us and you've got embracing the magic. That's basically where the whole, you know, some sum, sum it all up. That's where it comes from. That is such a great theme though. And especially for like the boys out there in that age group, they need that guidance. They need that, that yes. information to kind of figure out their own place in life because it's a lot different now for them than it was for like all of us back in the day. Right. And it's funny you say that about focus on boys because originally I started, I was the one of the leaders for my daughter's Girl Scout troop. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that they were all, reading books, but they were all male boy protagonists that they were all reading. I'm like, girls need more books. And this was like in 2012. And that's when I started getting the idea. But with a lot of personal things going on, I never moved on it. Mm -hmm. and, and now there's quite a few more books out there with girl protagonists. But then when I did start writing, I still had that idea. My first book, which I don't know if I'll ever bring back out and, and yeah. redo, um, but it was a female protagonist and I liked her and I've had in this one, I've got Clarice, mm -hmm. but I also started seeing how you don't have to get the girls to read. Girls will read more than boys. That's boys true. are the harder one to read. So I wanted to try and create something that the boys can relate to. Now, Harry Potter is a great example. And yes, a lot of people could say, well, this is just kind of Harry Potter. Well, of course, aren't a lot of stories just like yeah. Harry Potter. It's the hero's journey. That's why people say, well, it's just Star Wars. Of course it is. There's 500 million other books out there like that. It's yeah. the point that that character may relate to and get some kid to say, I, I, I understand him. This clicks with me. Harry Potter may not. It, it Obviously, it clicked with most people, but there may be some that have some other reason they need a different character. And, you know, that's why I can create a fantasy story that does have magic, but it is not Harry Potter. It still has a lot of the hero's journey in it. And you'll just have that. <laughs> yeah, I you know that's actually that's really good. And there it has been more of a surgence of like female protagonist books, because I remember going up. Yeah, the, I struggled to find books that had female leads. And then now I write them and there's a lot of people like me that have put them out there and it's just kind of taken over. But like good newer strong books featuring a male protagonist that's teach helping especially with middle grade like that 
all I can think of that are good middle grade books, and this is probably what just my generation thing were like Hank the Cow Dog and stuff like that growing up. And they need those. Like they're important because like you said, boys right. do struggle to keep like to read more and want to read more versus the girls. And, and I've got a, an author friend, Jeff Strand, who I love. Mm-hmm. He's one of my favorite new authors. He has written a couple young adult middle grade ish books mm-hmm. and they are very funny, hilarious. They're a little different than a lot of the books in that age range. And I know a lot of teachers have praised him and said, oh my gosh, thank you for these books because I have students that just cannot stand to pick up a book and read and they read your book and asked for more. And one of the, I I do, I'm starting to do a lot of work with teachers and homeschoolers and getting kids to write. That's one of my big goals. And I'm trying to And I know I'm fighting the education system and decades of thought and uh, administration and that, but there's a lot of teachers that agree with me Mm -hmm. that we shouldn't just say, well, you know, Catcher in the Rye is a classic book and everybody should read it. So we're going to make our kids read it. But then all the kids hate it and they don't want to read anymore. That doesn't make sense to me. Yes. I think I 100% agree. Yes. 100%. Because you want them to love reading. You don't want them to hate it. Yes. And 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 some of Jeff's books, the teachers have said, we gave them to our kids. They read them. They wanted more. And then if they want to, they'll you do Catcher in the Rye. They'll do uh, Harper Lee. They'll do Ray Bradbury and all the classics and figure it out. Or they'll read something else. It, yeah. It's better to get them to read and enjoy it than to force something on them and turn all of them away from it. And the other thing mm-hmm. I'm working on to get with, educators, which I think a lot would agree with is we, we work with our kids starting very early with spelling, right? We all bring home the spelling list for the spelling test on Friday and grammar and where to put the comma and the apostrophes and all these rules. But what do they mean? Why are we learning spelling and rules? That doesn't make sense when you're that grade because you haven't written anything. And I think we should forget about spelling and grammar until fourth, fifth grade and just get them to write because if they write something and they write stories and they learn how to write, then, well, this word isn't correct or they'll start finding the words that aren't correct. And and let's face it, every tool they use nowadays will tell them the grammar and the spelling, no matter what we do. So they're not going to care about that. But if they're writing something, they care about their writing, they're going to want to do the grammar and spelling. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's just natural. I, I I, I just think these types of things are important for our kids to, to read and write. And they're both equally important in my mind. And I'm, so I'm working with kids. I've got a meetup or not a meetup, but a school visit next month where I'm doing something with the kids. And it's, it's a test. Uh, yeah. and, and instead of just an author visit of, Hey, I'm the author and look what I wrote and, you know, and all that, which is great. I don't know if this school has had that, but I want to go in and, turn it on its side a little bit for the kids because whenever you get an adult, kids are always like, eh. but yeah. you get that adult that's defying the administration a little bit and making the kids feel like they're right and important. Isn't that what every kid's movie mm-hmm. is? It, you know, it, it, Stranger Things, that's what it was. We can't tell the adults. We've got to figure it out. They're all like that. Yeah. So I, I'm, the basic gist of it is I'm going to tell the kids, look, I was supposed to come in here and talk to you about my book but I'm in trouble. My editor and publisher want the next book and I can't figure out what to write. I need help and get them and say, here's the beginning of it. What should I do next? And get them to uh, help figure out the story of what I'm going to do next and the people in it and the characters and the scenes. And the the, the other reason for this is because I'm working also (laughs) on storytelling in video games with kids. So this is like a precursor to to how to make up a story for a video game and get them, get them more interested and interactive. I'm not saying author visits are bad. It's just, I, I don't always like to do what everybody else does. So yeah, I'm going to no, give that a test. That's to see awesome. <laughs> I think it's per- personally, it's awesome. My mom just got a principal position and I'm already like, she's trying to switch it back to where it's not so test focused. Like it has been for many schools for like, a long time, like I don't even know when it started, because it was like that when I was in school. Right. And get it back to where it's children focused, not like everybody is just blanketed into this thing. Because like it's 
it's crazy. It's, I won't even elaborate like on it because I know you get it. And it's, yeah. But like, I have a five-year-old that's in free gay and I'm like, I don't want him to like lose the desire to be creative because he's being forced to do a certain way, a certain yes. thing. And like, so I, I totally get it. And like, that's awesome that you're going in and doing that because you're bringing something inspiring to kids and maybe that will open their creativity if it's been closed off. Yes. And, and there are more schools that are starting to break the idea of what mm -hmm. education is and means uh, that it's a battle and you know, not everybody is getting it. I know my kids went to a local STEM high school that had opened like two years before my son went and they tried to do things a little different. And even some of the parents don't always get it. And yeah. there's some battles and fighting, but I think that there's different ways of learning. I'm the type that if you are talking to me and trying to show it to me, I will shut down and I'm like not getting you. But if you hand it to me in a book, then I'll get it. So uh, when I do things with work, if I get a video to show me how to do something, it's harder for me mm -hmm. to do it. But if you sh give me a written instructions, I'll fly through it and, and grasp it like that and remember it. It's just, we, we've been teaching kids, this is, you know, we have to quantify it so much yes. that they're losing out on the learning. And, and in my book, Embracing the Magic, at the back, I've got words to know. I have um, some prompts in a way for writing, uh, mm -hmm. to write fan fiction or the, mm -hmm. the follow-up short story type thing for my book. And I have a study guide, which I'm working on including in the one short story, there's a recipe or there's a, 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 a thing mentioned. So I, I'm coming up with a recipe of that item. My sister, who's a chef, is doing the video and creating it. So I'm working on getting that up on my website and everything pretty quick. That would be awesome. That is so, I love that idea. Sorry, I'm trying not yeah. to like go into fan mode, but like, I'm like, okay, this is something my son's going to have when he gets a little bit older because we're just starting to read now. Nice. Gosh, that's so crazy. But like, okay, so back to the video game, like all of that, how, how did you get started with that idea? Like what, how do you, okay, I'm trying to think how to word this question. Like you focus on like one specific age group? Well, I, I, I've said middle grade, but it's maybe been pre-middle grade, the tween age. Um, it, it's hard for me for that because when I was six and I was in kindergarten, I was reading Hardy Boy books to my grandfather. And by the time I was 10, my mother got me a box set of Stephen King and I read all of those uh, that year. And I was 10 years old. And the year after that, when I was 11, was Lord of the Rings, the Tolkien trilogy. So I have a hard time. I, I kind of skipped from picture books into adult books. So the, the middle grade, sometimes the age ranges elude me, but I always try and push a little bit. I want mm -hmm. kids. I know there have been a, a few things in my book where the editor said, you might want to take that out. It's too big of a word. I said, perfect. Leave it because yeah. they're going to figure it out or they're going to want to know what it is. So it brings up discussion or maybe they'll look it up, uh, yeah. you know, reading it on Kindle and they highlight it and it brings up the definition. Yes. That's yes. Perfect. That's you know, something they encourage us to do with English as kids. Why yes. not do it now? When yes. it's a lot easier instead of having to walk yes. around the dictionary. And, and I made up a few words and threw them in there just because they yes. sounded funny. And, you know, and I've had people say, well, you can't make up words. I'm like, why not? Shakespeare did. Words have always been made up. You know, I yeah. mean, come on. And I if mean, there's been. like slang in the dictionary now that used to be not be words like ain't. I remember people saying ain't, ain't a word and I ain't going to use it. I'm like, but that's right. now like in a dictionary. Right. So, and, and my kids would say, I'm going to yeet it. And I'm like, what the heck yes. is yeet? You know, well, now that's in the <laughs> urban dictionary, at least, you know, so yes. it, language is not a set defined thing. And even the rules change and have changed. And we know there's different you know, MLA and Chicago style. So there's different rules. So you can't tell me that's the only way to do it. I, oh man, I had this other idea, Maddie. I, I said, why don't we write a whole story, a whole book that's nothing but problems and errors that every bit of the book, there's misspellings, there's grammar problems. Oh, and, and, <laughs> you know, that way when they're reading it, they could, they'll, they'll catch on to that. The kid, even without 
knowing every problem, they'll start seeing there's no apostrophes, there's no commas. Yeah. That word is misspelled. Uh, you know, some kid will get it and show others or something like that. So, but I don't know how to get that book past like Amazon's yeah. checker and things yeah. like that, you know? <laughs> I'm glad to just make it and sell it from my website because it won't pass any of the stores. Yeah, that's true. It'd be like, you have to correct this and have like, it's huge. Three thousand like, errors, oh. chapter one. <laughs> yes. Like, um, it's supposed to be like, yes. but that would be a very fun, like, especially kind of like a creative tool that you could use in classes. So, yes. oh. it, the, the thing is, I though, can't. I could see it definitely be an argument of there should be a comma here. No, there shouldn't be that if you have this and this which is good too because it brings up the point that it's not definite in our rules for grammar and language you know there could you know why there could be reasons and, and the great thing is if you wrote a book that's nothing but errors makes everything else you write look even better because yes. there's less errors yes oh my gosh yes so i'm gonna take us back and we're gonna jump back on samuel here how okay. does he meet rory like how does how did the two first wow. meet how do they first meet? So Rory is the town magician for the town that Samuel lives in. Mm -hmm. He's younger, 20 ish. Samuel's 10 to 12 ish. And every town is supposed to have a town magician that in the old days, they kept the town safe, but things are pretty settled now. So now they, they help support the town. If they do good shows, people come in. It's like commerce. You know, if you have a big concert, people come in and spend money at the local places. They have market day and they usually do that on the same day. So the better magicians, people want to go and sell at market and then see the show. So more people, there's a bigger market. People come, you know, it's a, it's a small, simple economy. Well, in one of the prequel stories that I've got, uh, Samuel's town doesn't have a town magician and it makes him sad uh, because he wants to see m magic, even though his father won't let him. And so they want a town magician because their town's going to die if they don't get one. So they get a new town magician and he's the son of a famous town magician mm -hmm. and he's going to do a show. Well, Samuel kind of sneaks in to watch the show, but by doing so he discovers it's that Rory's a fake. It's not real magic. And when I say magic, it's not just, you know, pull the rabbit out of the hat. We know we have magicians that they have tricks that are, you know, fake. We know that, but we like being fooled. Here in their world, they really do channel magic. So when they create a fireball, it's real fire appearing. It's not something up their sleeve. Yeah. Except for Rory. He really does have something up his sleeve. He has the rabbit hidden in the hat. And yeah. Samuel discovers this and he's trying to get people to listen to him. But because he doesn't have magic and because his father is kind of the outcast of the town, nobody wants to listen to him and mm -hmm. it frustrates him. So that's kind of how they meet. Uh, uh, everyone's laughing at Samuel. And then here in Embracing the Magic, uh, there is a evil magician, a wizard that comes and challenges Rory to a duel. And Samuel's like, see, he can't do it. He's fake. And Rory says, well, I'm going to go train with the Grand Wizard. And Samuel, he, he's lying. He's not going to the Grand Wizard. He's going to run away. Yeah. And so Samuel kind of tags along to find out. And that's where everything else happens. Ooh. Figure it out. Ooh. Hold on just a second. My son is. Oh, yeah. What's up, bud? Can you have some more chicken? I don't have any more chicken. You have to eat your french fries and then get a different snack, okay? Oh, that's on the grocery list. Hey, close the door all the way. Or not. Okay, it's close, mostly. Sorry. I, I, I miss that age quite a bit. They're so much fun at that age. Probably why I like to write for that, you know? Yes. That's, like, on my list is to write stories for him. Like, it's – I'm slowly getting there because I feel like a door finally opened because I found somebody that illustrates that's a local because they help run an art studio. And I was like, okay. Nice. It's so, Things are coming together now. So, my cover – yeah. Was, written, was drawn by an artist up in Cleveland by the name of Tom Zoller. And Ooh. he's amazing. I love the cover. But he also was involved with the My Little Ponies reboot of a few years ago. No so, way. Yeah, claim, claim so there. awesome. I loved the original, like, My Little Ponies, but my niece did the whole, like, the newer My Little yeah. Ponies phase. And so I was like, oh, yay, it's coming back. So I didn't get everything from, like, 
my childhood has started coming back around and I'm like, I've had that too. Kind of so weird, but I'm kind of excited, nostalgic, like, right. Oh, so you have a pet wolf, right? Yes. yes. How does he like, where does, does he have a role in the story? Cause you said he kind of helped with inspiration, right? He, he is my muse. He's my inspiration. Uh, partly because when you say I have a wolf, people go, what, excuse me? I'm like, yeah, wolf. And they're like, ah, it's a hus No, he's wolf. He's 75, 80% Sarloos wolf. He's a big boy. Um, when he leans on you, when, when you're petting him, he'll knock you over if you're not careful. Yeah, they're uh, huge. And, and you don't want to go and try and grab his food when he's eating because he will snap at you. He is still wolf, but he's a goofy boy. He's uh, loving and a uh, warm fur coat. I mean, it's thick and very luscious. So he is not in the, these stories, the Samuel stories. But I have another series of kids that are like a, in a way, like a Scooby-Doo group. Uh, they do yeah. supernatural investigations, like ghost mm -hmm. hunting and things. And they each have different uh, uh, skill set. But they have a wolf. Uh, as their pet named Hunter. And Aww. in the second story, he is integral to helping them solve it and figure it out. So I just threw Hunter in that story and it's going to be coming. I have it ready to go, but I don't want to put too much out in different series. I'm trying to get book two done and then start getting some yeah. other. Oh, that is so awesome. And I, I'm totally like fascinated with the fact that you have a wolf. I've seen one wolf mix in person it was at the vet somebody brought it in for a checkup and stuff and i was just like oh my gosh i was in love with it like i mean what did you have to this is probably more personal like curiosity <laughs> what did you have to go through to actually no it, he i'm not sure the whole story mm -hmm. um it was my ex-wife she rescued him oh. and so he came with her <laughs> and yeah. um then uh he just, he stayed with me that I kept him uh, because he's big and he needs the area. You know, he can't be in an apartment or anything yeah. like that. So we've got the area here and he's got a nice place for him and all that. So uh, I, I, and I guess, so the, the thing is he's got a limp paw. He ha he's missing some bones in a paw. So it, it oh, yeah. bends funny and they were going to kill him. And that's why she rescued him. She couldn't bear to see him killed. So, he, uh, you know, became more of a pet than the, the wolf, though he has gotten loose a couple times and uh, he comes back and he's carrying something in his mouth. So I don't know what he hunted down, but, <laughs> you know, Sorry, that's how it is. Chats. Yes. <laughs> but that is so cool. Like I saw that on the document you filled out for like pre-interview. It was like, oh, I have to ask about him. Like. I, I do have some cool. pictures up on uh, my Facebook page and I'm going to put a few more on my website. Oh, yes. Wolves are like my thing. That's they're in. I, I write a lot of stories with shifters in them and wolves oh. always find a way in. I've always been drawn Beautiful. to it. And I in, used my inspiration was the former red wolf that used to inhabit like the Oklahoma area. That's basically almost completely extinct there's like maybe five or six and they're in a kind of like a sanctuary area on the eastern coast sorry i'm pointing in directions not that it matters <laughs> where we're at right now but like i did a lot of research on them and stuff before i started writing them into stories nice kind of like wolves are my thing so and, and it was definitely like the super curiosity part of it yeah, wolves are wonderful. He's a great boy. I love him. Does he hang out with you while you ride? Uh, I do have a, not usually. He can get destructive uh, if you take him like inside, which we have done, but he gets excited and he'll go running and like just jump onto the dining room table. And he's big enough that he hits the light chandelier <laughs> and broke things and, and he goes running and slid and knocked the tv over and and then if you leave him too long he'll just start chewing and eating things and his he he we had to get very thick chains because he can eat through them so oh, when he starts it. eating the couch he's like eating the couch so he's not an indoor dog at all but i have had him in the office and i do have a picture of him on my couch sitting there while i was writing one day oh that is so awesome Speaking of writing, what does your typical writing routine look like? 
Well, I do have a full-time job. I'm a computer programmer on top of this. And I usually try and write early in the morning. I get up, exercise, eat, and then I will go and do some writing. And I've really been trying to stick to that this year because with one book out, you, you can't just stop, especially yeah. when you want four. And if you want to get them out anytime soon, you've got to get writing in as much as you can. So most weekdays I'm sitting here for at least a half hour, 45 minutes. And I, I don't care what else. My, my problem is, oh, I know I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And, and I start getting distracted doing other things which can usually wait for a half hour while I write. And so mm-hmm. I've started doing that. And every now and then I'll be somewhere and I can pull out my laptop and just start writing. And uh, that I don't do quite as much, but yeah. uh, I try to. Sometimes you have to. <laughs> mm-hmm. I've been trying to push myself to use my laptop more lately than I have been in a while. Because I started out using that. Then I went to a desktop and now I'm like, okay, I need to try to get more in because I can't sit here. Right. As often as I would like, because as you saw earlier, my child likes to invade. (laughs) Yes. Well, we also have a small cabin. We have an upper acre with woods and it has a a small cabin in there. It's only like 14 by 16, but it has a porch. So when the weather's nice, I can take my laptop and go sit up there and I'm in wooded area uh, and Hunter's close by. So it works well, and it's a good inspirational to sit and write. You get calming, and it's really nice. But I, I, there's no Wi-Fi up there, no internet, no electricity. So, you know, if my laptop's about to die, well, I'm done. Because I, I cannot do the longhand. I can't even read my own writing, and, <laughs> and let alone. So I think God invented word processors so authors could write more. That would make sense. <laughs> it is. Yeah, because my handwriting's okay, but there are times if I'm trying to write an idea out fast, longhand, I'm like, I go back and I'm like, I have no idea what I wrote here. So I just kind of make it up. So So you mentioned you have four books planned in the series. Are you going to continue to keep uh, Samuel as the main character? For those four, yes. I have thoughts for a few other books Uh, beyond Samuel, Mm -hmm. Uh, like going back 200 years when magic was first discovered. I mentioned in the book uh, the the guy who discovered the magic, but I don't tell any more than that. I don't go into background in detail because that may be a book at some point on its own, but you know, the the seed is set uh, with that. And people talk about this guy, you know, in the world, because, you know, that's what we do. We talk about Washington and Lincoln. It's just, you know, we don't, every time we talk, say, well, uh, Lincoln, who freed the slaves in the Civil War and got shot. And we don't do that every time. We just say Lincoln and move on. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what they do in this book. And I know my editor was like, well, who is this guy? Give us more background. I'm like, no, nah, that's going to be another book. Leave it. Well, people want to know. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure they will. So they'll hopefully get the book later. <laughs> yes. Inspiration to buy the backstory. Right. You got to do it, guys. Like, that's where it's at. That's if, if you want to know about it. You've you got to do that and like right. do it and- that way. And book four is several years after book one, things are changing in their lives. And there's some things that happen in book three and four that, you know, if Samuel's life is disrupted and changed in book one, books three and four do it again in totally different ways with different things going on. So by the end of book four, it's, there's some things I can focus on in books five, six, seven, that don't necessarily deal with Samuel, but he's more of a, almost a minor character at that point. So uh, I, I've got some ideas. I, I mean, I've got them planned out. I just got to actually write those words. Yeah. And that's, I feel like that's harder to do sometimes is finding the time just to get it all out, especially yeah. with a busy life. And like you said, you work too. So it's right. another obstacle to jump over to get them down. Right. Yeah. And and sometimes you get distracted. Like I said, I have that other series of the supernatural ghost hunting kids. And those started off as short stories I wrote for my kids at Christmas. I'm fleshing them out in the books. Mm -hmm. There's five of those. So I have five stories already just need expanded a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, yeah, if I really could, if I could stop mowing lawn and having to make yes. dinner and eat and write a little more every day, yes. I'd get these out a lot quicker. <laughs> oh, I feel that so much like I do. Uh, if I could just take a little more of that time and like, yeah. yes. Um, 
So with everything you've got going on with balancing work and writing and family life and everything, how do you take care of your mental health? Do you have a self-care routine or a method that you kind of stick with or anything specific? But specific. Oh. <laughs> I, I am one of those people that really do relax and enjoy doing the writing. It's not job like at all for me. Yeah. And I, and with the video game stuff I'm doing for kids, I enjoy doing that and I'm working on a game so I can use that as an example. So doing, and even my podcast and all these related items, doing these things is the relaxing part for me is the part I enjoy and I want yeah. to do more. So just writing helps that a lot. And my kids, you know, have always helped that. Uh, when they were younger, we, we had many, many things we used to do. And that was always exciting. And now they're a little older. Uh, if I can get them to play a game, gaming, playing games for me is very therapeutic and relaxing. Okay. Reading, um, you know, I've got my stack of to read books. So it's like, okay, should I spend the half hour reading or writing? Because they're both important. Yeah. Uh, and I really want to read this latest book or new, the book that's been sitting here for three years needs yes. read. You know, so uh, all of those things are uh, very therapeutic for me. And I, I know I talk about kids and, you know, I'm very much immersed into that childlike thinking world. But uh, I, my kids' mother and I got a divorce and it was very toxic mm -hmm. and very rough for eight years. And to help uh, get over that, I wrote some books about uh, high conflict divorce and toxic relationships. Mm -hmm. And those are still out there and up there. And I I've been making a couple hundred bucks off of those each year. So that was therapeutic is yeah. all the, yeah. everything I from that put into those books and then just let them go. And, you know, every time I get a couple cents, I'm like, all right. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> he helped with that. And actually, that's a good thing that you put that out there because there's a lot of that going on. And it's, I feel like people are realizing the toxic, I don't even know how to toxicity. Like, yeah, the toxicity of yeah. like the relationship more now than what they did in the past. And it's just, yeah, so that's good that that's out there. And it's not that it's a bad thing to get out of it. Absolutely get out right. of it. If it is. Right. But, and, and that, you know, you're right because people keep buying them. I don't even advertise them. I don't, they're not even like number one in the stores and I'm still every week, there's a couple that'll sell. So I, you know, that's, that helped me a lot. So now, yeah. And, and I don't have to worry about the kids so much. So that stress is off of me and I can concentrate on working every day. So then I can set aside the time to write or go game with friends or whatever. Ooh, I like that. That's good. And that is, I like that your creativity and everything that you enjoy the writing and it helps with that self-care. That's perfect. Cause a lot of authors have lost touch with that. And I like to highlight self-care to kind of bring focus back into that. So you kind of bring it back into your life, you know? And, and you really do have to enjoy what you do mm -hmm. because if you have a job that's just killing you and stressing you out, why is it necessarily worth it? Yeah. And you, you know, you miss time with your family and friends because you're so stressed out or tired and stress will drain you and yeah. it'll kill you. So yeah, absolutely. Oh, man. Okay. If you could offer a piece of advice to a newly published author, whether they be indie or traditional, what piece of advice would you share with them? This is actually something I've talked with other authors about and I understand I haven't been around forever writing and I don't have a ton of books out, but looking back on where I am and what I've learned, I would say don't focus so much on that one book and put every bit of time, effort, energy, and life in that one book for years. It, it really isn't worth it. Uh, you are much better off writing that book, putting it aside, writing the next book, putting it aside, writing the next book. And in between, just write short stories that deal with that or other things and get short stories out. Because just like I said earlier with the kids, the, the writing and the storytelling doesn't always make sense until you've written a bunch of words. And some of the things that I was told or I read and learned earlier, I was like, okay, great. Now I know how to do it. And then I wrote, but I wasn't applying it because it really didn't click and make sense. But once I had something under my belt, some of that stuff I learned is like, oh, now it makes sense. 
And so when I read, it's always in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, how so-and-so did this description. You know, my story over here that I was working on, mm-hmm. I could go change that and it would improve my story. And that's, and I'm slowly learning just from reading. So I would tell everybody, write and write and write. And don't worry, don't worry about the grammar. Don't worry about the spelling. Yes. That's all easy, fixable. Worry about making a good story and getting that out there. And as you write more, you don't even have to like, go back and edit and edit and edit and tweak and change and tweak. You know, I I know somebody who has been working on the same book for four years and they keep changing and tweaking and adjusting. And it's little things like this word here. I don't know how many books I've ever read where I can say, okay, well, in chapter three, the fourth Mm -hmm. paragraph, this sentence was like, no, you remember the overall story, Mm -hmm. you know? So if it's a good overall story, your your sentences could get better, but it's not going to change that story for the people. So that's something I try and keep in mind now. Oh, yes. Such, that's great advice. And our final question for okay. the show today is, what do you feel success looks like for you? Success for me. I would love to say that I'm earning enough money to quit my day job, but that's not the actual success I want to get to. I want to have a a, several series of books out that kids enjoy reading and that inspires other kids to write and, and and makes kids want to read and explore reading. So that's more of my goal is getting kids to read and write uh, and enjoying it and finding the fun in fantasy and magic and some of the other things I'm writing about that, that would be, if I, if I could have, kids come up to me when they're in their twenties and bring their kids and say, yeah, I read these books when I was young. You need to read these and get that right there. I I win. Yes. Yes. Well, Steven, thank you so much for being on my show today. It's been great, Maddie. You've been a lot of fun. Go ahead before we go, tell our listeners and viewers where they can snag some of your work and follow you. Well, like everybody, uh, every my book's going to be everywhere. I'm, I had to fix some things with Amazon, uh, but I, I've put it up and pulled it back a couple times. And I've got the two prequel stories, which is going through an editor and being improved right now. So every, all the stores, but to see where all those stores are, you can just go to my website, sa-schneider.com. And Schneider is S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R. Uh, and everything's going to be there. And I keep adding articles and videos for helping teachers and parents to inspire their kids for writing and articles to help with doing things in school with uh, free software and other things. So I keep adding more articles and videos and things up there too. Awesome. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already. Drop us a comment. Let us know what your favorite question was or maybe something you want me to ask authors on future shows. But other than that, have a good day, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to get future notifications when shows come out. Also, be sure to check out my website. I have a blog featuring this creative with some other fun and interesting questions. You can also subscribe to my newsletter there to stay up to date with all things The Chapter Goddess and Madeline Dale. Once again, thanks for watching and have a great rest of the day.